Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whenever it is that you happen to be watching this. Uh, this is the first of the two recorded lectures on some slightly advanced topics in Pico 8, stuff that you might be using for your major project. The first one is going to be talking about some simplistic artificial intelligence stuff, talk about some advanced topics, but not actually go through implementation details. Uh, talk about sort of how you would approach that in Pico 8. Um, and then the second lecture is going to be procedural generation of levels and how to handle that sort of thing in uh, your game. Uh, but to start, I've got uh, my development stuff set up in Atom, which is a really nice um, development uh, system. And there's a Pico 8 uh, sort of um, editor overlay for this. Um, it works out really nice. As you can see, it's got all the nice syntax highlighting. And the other thing is that it does actually take the GFX data and uh, map it and so that you can actually kind of see it in this. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to be editing in here and then switching back, oops, switching back over to the uh, Pico 8 stuff for the purposes of the actual run. So I'm just going to load uh, uh, the record lecture 1.p8 here. Take a look at what's here. Basically, this is not anything particularly interesting. I've got a single player and a single player sprite, uh, which is I actually need to change this so that it's the proper one here. So change this to oh, wait, that's one. Okay. That's the player speed, not the player thing. Uh, and I've got my bump function that we had talked about, the, the, the map-based bump function. Um, and then my updates for movement, and then my draw function. And you can see three there as my draw element. So uh, if I actually go to run this, then you can see that I've got my little guy here that moves around in mostly the cardinal directions. Uh, I've got borders along um, all of these sides that, uh, that that sort of just narrow my field here and make it look a little bit nice and neat. Uh, but that's basically all I've got. If I look actually at the sprites that I've created, I have some I have some block sprites and I've got some sprites for enemies. We're only going to really use one of these uh, enemy sprites and we're going to use the block sprites in this particular demo. We'll use this little present sprite um, as a goal sprite in the procedural generation uh, uh, little lecture and then we'll take that as a way of transitioning levels so that you can see a little bit of that. Some of you did this in your demo uh, your 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 first your mini project demo. So the the at least the the flip uh, will be uh, something that you you pr you are probably familiar with. Anyways, all right. So let's get started. Uh, what I need to start with is uh, a list called enemies. And so if I switch back over here, I'm going to create uh, my enemies table. Oops. Nope. There we go. And I'm just going to populate this with uh, two enemies here uh, and then give all of those enemies an X and Y value. So enemies 1.x is equal to 70. Enemies 1.y is equal to 90. And then create enemies 2 and then do the same thing. Enemies 2.x is equal to... 34, sure, uh, and enemies 2.y is equal to 110. All right, so no movement yet, um, just the, the, the enemies, and then I want to actually draw those um, down, down at the bottom. So I want a function here that says for i in all enemies do and just basically just draw this so SPR and I want this to be 
uh, one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then i dot x, i dot y. All right, so that's in draw, just to draw the enemies out. And if I come back over to uh, here, I just load this again. So load uh, chord lecture one, run it again, and I've got my two little um, two little enemy sprites uh, just sitting here at the bottom. Easy peasy. We're going to um, notice a couple things here, right? Like there's the, there's just no collision whatsoever. They're just blank sprites that are drawn on a layer that's sort of one ahead of the uh, the player sprite. A uh, couple things that I want, right? Like I want this as soon as it collides to do some sort of death uh, thing, game over, or whatever. Again, uh, the game over stuff, uh, pretty much everybody had um, in one way or another, one shape or another. Uh, so this shouldn't be anything new to you. Um, but I do want to talk about collisions in regards to enemies. Collisions in regards to enemies are a little bit different than they are for uh, just static sprites. Because we've got, hopefully, in a little bit, we've got two different uh, ways of where two things could actually collide with each other, we need a little bit more sophisticated uh, collision than we did with bump. And the other thing of it is that bump is limited because we're dealing with the map, right? And so because I'm not dealing with the map for these draws, I need it to actually do some collision um, that's, a, that's, that's different, that's sprite-based. So we're going to use a technique called bounding box. Um, and this is a common technique in game development. Um, you, you can see it in a lot of different places, where we're, whether we're talking about bounding boxes, bounding cubes, bounding spheres. Uh, bounding spheres is uh, what's usually used for sort of multi-dimensional, three-dimensional objects um, because it, it happens to, to sort of sit better with than bounding boxes. Uh, Two-dimensional games tend to use just bounding squares, bounding boxes for this. So we're going to use bounding boxes. Um, in addition, I'm going to draw in some tiles, some tiles, some nice clean tiles here uh, to also have some collision. And then I'm going to incorporate my new bounding box collision um, into both my movement stuff and also my enemy movement when I get to it. All right. So let's hop on back over here. And so I've got my enemies table here. I'm going to have a, uh, a table here called tiles. Uh, we'll use the name tiles uh, a couple of different times uh, between uh, this lecture and then the other lecture. So I'm going to make this a little bit easier on myself. I'm going to copy this from my finished one. So ch -ch 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 -ch. copy all of these. Copy it over here, save that. And all I'm doing here is just creating a, a bunch of squares based off of uh, the tile stuff that I had um, originally. I also want this to go ahead and draw. So for I in all tiles, do I had this issue in uh, algorithms and data structures where I started off with an if statement and then I wanted to write then and it's because I've been doing this too much. Um, so yeah, that was fun. Uh, so SBR2 um, and then i.x, i.y. Um, as you notice, we populated all of these just like we did with enemies. So X and Y inside the tables uh, to actually hold this. All right, so pop on back over here. Uh, escape, do my load again, do my run again, and look, I've got um, a, a nice little sort of shelf uh, between my two enemies and my player sprite. But again, uh, there's no collision. So uh, be, because bump um, doesn't work with sprites, uh, bump's not actually telling me or, or telling the, uh, the update function that I can't actually run into this. All right. So let's head on back and let's talk about collision. So what I want here for my collision, uh, I'm going to write a new function and I'm going to call it ncollide. 
and it's going to take in uh, two xy pairs. So x1, y1, x2, y2. And basically what I want here is uh, a way to detect when um, the boxes have collided with each other. And uh, something to think about this is actually uh, thinking about it in the reverse way. So whether or not borders have, um, whether or not all of my borders are actually apart, meaning that there are no borders that are touching or within each other, um, and then actually checking for uh, the false version of that. And so what I want here is a return. So x2 greater than x1 plus 8, or x2 plus 8 less than x1, or y2 greater than y1 plus 8, or y2 plus 8 less than y1. And whether or not that whole thing, that or statement, is false. The only way that that is false is if every single one of those is also false because it's an or uh, it's an or and so if any one of those is violated i know my two boxes are, are are colliding with each other on some border so if one of those is true i think i might have said that wrong just a second ago then there, there are two borders that are actually touching at at, at a given time if you, if you have a hard time actually sort of picturing this, think of it, and again, one of the reasons for the 8 is that all of our sprites are 8 pixels in width, so keep just keep that in mind. Draw it out. Draw it out. Draw out each individual thing, each individual one of these um, options, and take a look at it. What you'll see is that these first two represent whether... The leftmost, let me make sure that I get this right. Yeah, the leftmost border of X2, whatever sprite X2 is referring to, is touching or within the rightmost border of X1, and vice versa. So that's checking my left and right borders and where they could be touching. Similarly, the these two here are checking my top and bottoms, right? Does the bottom of uh, Y1 touch the top of Y2 and vice versa? All right. It's a nice, easy, clean way to detect whether two bounding boxes, and the fortunate thing is because of the way the Pico 8 is working, because I know that I've got eight by eight uh, boxes, I know that this is going to be an 8x8 box every single time. If you have multi-box sprites, you're going to have to change this a little bit. Uh, but uh, I trust that you're going to be able to figure that out. All right, so what do I want here? Well, I want um, in my buttons here, in my button handles, I want to actually check to see if... Um, if I've got my my collisions here. All right. So if I change this slightly, I can do this, right? So if n collide px py and then I need some stuff for my tiles. So I need this actually in a for loop. So for i in all tiles do if my collision is true for my player sprite and i dot x and i dot y then go ahead and put in my ends here then i want to move it back Right, so this is going to be uh, px plus equals three, and I only need to collect to 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 catch this once, right? 
And so as soon as I click check it, then I'm going to go ahead and actually just break out of my for loop so that I'm not doing any extra work. I don't need this plus three. I need this to be P speed. All right. And then I can do this. Let me make sure that I get this right. Yep. I can do this for all of these, replacing my bump function. So this one's going to be minus equals P speed. This one's going to be PY plus equals P speed. And then this one's going to be uh, PY minus equals P speed. All right, and that should take care of all of that. So let's check that. Let's switch back over here, do my load, do my run, and voila. There's still some issues here, right? Like I, I'm not going all the way to the border, um, just like I don't go all the way to the border. Well, I used to not go all the way to the border over here. Um, so there are some things that you're going to have to sort of massage here, but it's good enough to show, show my issues. All right. So, with that end collide, I can also do my, uh, my, my death check. So, all the way at the end of my update function, after I've taken care of all of the, the, the details with uh, my buttons and such, I want to actually check to see if, I'm, uh, if I'd collided with an enemy. And this is going to be basically the very, very last thing that I check. So, for I in all enemies do do the end there if and collide py px py ix iy and what I want here is a check to see if I, I've game overed all right and so what I'm going to do here is actually set up a boolean called game over. I'm going to set that equal to true here. All the way at the top, I'm going to add this flag. Game over is equal to false. And we're going to use this in draw. So game over true down here. Game over false all the way at the, uh, at the top. I'm going to use this flag to determine when to flip over to uh, the, the, my game over screen. It says that I've collided with an enemy. I want instant death here. So in my draw, I'm going to switch this so that I'm going to do my clear as normal. And then as long as game over is equal to false, then do all of this stuff. So switch all of this stuff over. All right, and then if it's not, then I want an else. So else print game over. And then I'm going to need some offsets. So 44, figure this out earlier, 44, 64 puts it basically in the center given the, 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 the number of letters and everything like that. All right, so let's see that. Let's load this, run it again. Oops. Uh, all right. What did I do here? If false, then... Hmm.
Oh, there we go. So I'm in the wrong spot. Mr. Then there. All right. All right. Load. Run. All right. Perfect. Still got our collision. And as soon as I run into that, bam, game over. Perfect. Let's try it again. Make sure that the other one works. Come in from a different angle. So let's come in from below. Perfect. Run it again. Come in from the side. And that should be good enough. Great. All right. So I've got an, I've got my game over screen going and everything else. Uh, perfect. All right. So let's actually do some artificial intelligence stuff. When we're talking about artificial intelligence as games, we're talking about um, basically sort of a multi-tiered thing. Uh, we're going to start with basically the simplest thing possible. Uh, simple scripted movements. So for me to do this, and, and what I mean by simple scripted movements, I mean that back-to-forth movement of... Uh, Goombas, Koopa Troopas, things like that, um, where I may want it to just go walk off the end of the the level, or I may want it to walk back and forth on a platform or something like that. In order to do this, I'm going to start off by creating a variable called PC, which basically means program counter. And this lets me sort of modulate what I'm doing at a given moment. And... I've got my PC is equal to zero. And then within my update function, I'm going to use that to move my enemy. So in here, I'm going to say if PC is less than 10, actually, let, let's do something small. Let's do five. Then I, I'm just going to move one. I'm just going to move the first uh, enemy. Enemies dot, enemies one dot X plus equals one. And if PC is greater than or equal to 5, then I'm going to move them back. All right. And so let's see what this looks like now. Load, run. Uh-oh, something went wrong. What went wrong? Well, if I'm going to have a program counter, one of the things that I absolutely have to do is actually increment the program counter. So PC plus equals 1. But I don't want it just to be plus equals 1, right? Because what happens when I do that? Well, if I come back over here, load run, I get it back in the reverse way. So I needed to, 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 to modulate this by using modulate. PC equals PC plus one. Put that in parens. And then mod it by, let's say, 10. All right, so that'll give me 0 through 4 in one direction, 5 through 9 in the other direction. Let's see how that looks. Perfect. Though, it's a little narrow, so let's change that, that parameter up a little bit. So let's say that instead, I'm going to say 24 here. So if PC is less than 12, and then PC greater than or equal to 12. Load and run. That's better. That's a better looking movement. And you can change this depending on your design. For this, this is good enough. All right, so that's the, the, the lowest tier artificial intelligence. It's not even intelligent, right? It just moves back and forth. So now what I want to do is to add something else. I want to add uh, a, 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 an enemy 
and I'm going to use uh, enemy sub 2 for this, that actually reads and reacts to my character. And so when I come back over here, I'm going to need some other stuff. I'm going to actually need a distance function. If I'm going to read and react, what I want is a way to determine how far I am from uh, whatever my target is. And because we're using a two-dimensional grid here, uh, there's a very, very easy way to do this. It's called Manhattan distance, or taxi cab routing, or um, uh, Cartesian distance. Uh, basically, it looks at how far over on X and how far over on Y, and then adds those two values together. And it works out very, very well for this. And so I'm going to have a distance here um, because I'm going to be gauging distance. Normally, if I had a distance function, I would take two pairs of x, y values. Um, in this case, because I know one of the pairs is always going to be the player, I'm going to use uh, px as sort of the automatic, px, poi in this um, automatically since they're global. So in my distance function, I'm just going to return abs so absolute value of px minus x1 plus the absolute value of py minus y1. And that will get me my, my Manhattan distance. If you wanted to have the actual diagonal distance here, um, all you would do is you would take that and divide it, and, and it would be fine. But in all intents and purposes, uh, because we're moving left and right, and not allowing diagonals, the actual true distance here is measured by my Manhattan distance. All right, so within this, I, I'm gonna to want to allow for my, my enemy, my enemy number two, to actually read and react to where uh, my, my user is, where my player is. So all the way here at the bottom, so after my enemy one movement, I'm gonna actually check this. So if dist distance of enemy sub two dot x comma enemies sub two dot y is let's say less than 30 then well at this point i need to figure out what's the what's the best direction to move and for me the best direction to move is whatever axis i'm farthest from so moving over by x moving over the short distance may not necessarily get me where i'm going i want to be greedy here and so I need to check if abs px minus enemies 2 dot x happens to be greater than abs of py minus enemies 2 dot y gets me my, my whatever the thing that is farthest here then I can do if px minus ix is less than zero. And we'll talk about what, what that is here in a second. Uh, this needs to be enemies two dot x. Enemies2.x equals, well, we'll do minus equals, we'll just move them by one, minus equals one. End. Else. So, else here means that I need this need this here 
Sorry about that. Enemies 2 dot x plus equals 1. All right. Now end. All right. So what does this, this one if statement, uh, this conditional do? This basically checks to see which direction I need to go on the x-axis. Do I need to go the minus direction or do, do I need to go the plus direction? Where is my player in respect to uh, my enemy? Great. Now else, and so this else means that y happens to be greater than or equal to. So I need to do the same thing, right? Py minus enemies 2 dot y less than zero, then enemies 2 dot y minus equals one else enemies 2 dot y plus equals one. End. End. All right, great. Let's see if this, if I screwed something up. I'm gonna bet I did. Run. Oh, wow, I didn't. Okay, so run. And now it reads and reacts and tries to chase my character down. But if you notice, this is uh, pretty close. So maybe I want to actually make some adjustments here. Maybe I want this, uh, instead of reacting at 30, maybe I want it to react at 70. Load, run. Oh no. All right. So, what did we notice there? Well, uh, the 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 enemy didn't collide against the the tiles. I have to collide against the tiles as the the player. It's not fair that they should that they can't that, that they shouldn't have to, right? So, I'm going to do another collision function here and i'm going to do two collision functions i'm going to do a separate collision function um and because uh, of the way that i have to check the tiles here so in here i'm going to have a function tile collide and tile collide has an x1 y1 value and what i wanted to do so have to have a uh, temp value here for i in all tiles. So check all of my tiles. Do if I can use my n collide here, right? X one y one i dot x y dot x. Uh, no, i dot y then if n collide is true then i'm going to say temp is true and and return temp now i could do this uh slightly differently right like as soon as i hit the n collide here i could just do return true um and that would work just fine um but the, the point is to make sure that you go through um, the tiles, right? So, yeah. All right. So, oop, you know what? It's not much point in having the tile collide here if I'm not actually going to use it. So, in here, I need to check for the tile collision. Um, so, I, I shouldn't allow for my movement unless the tile uh, the tile doesn't collide so if this is true i'm going to also check here if tile collide enemies 2 dot x comma enemies 2 dot y then do this
And then I'm going to use this basically everywhere. So this is going to be uh, plus equals x. minus equals on y and then plus equals on y all right uh, except I definitely don't want this to be true right so I want this to be false so go false 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 all right all right Let's see if we, we got it. Load, run. Let's see if we can escape. Oh, look at that. Collision at its finest. Oh, I just ran into it. Okay. Now what? Well, I've collided, but there seems to be some other issue here. So one of the things that we're going to want to look at as far as that collision goes is what's going on in here that actually prevents me from doing my movement down, right? Because it should allow me to move south at this point. And it could be that it's as simple as changing this ch to moving it up and then moving it back if it collides. But we can figure that out another time. All right, so one of the things that you, you noticed out of here, oops, wrong way. One of the things that you can notice out of here is that it'll get stuck, right? It'll get stuck in this corner. Maybe we want that. Probably we don't, right? And so if we want this, then we just leave it the way, the way it is. And to be honest with you, a lot of uh, 2D-based games allow for this, right? It's an actual strategic thing. But we can do better. And while I'm not going to show you this in code, because this is already getting a little long, um, I do want to put it in your, your head that this is something that is possible within Pico 8. Normally, when we're talking about things that have the ability to get around this, we want something that allows for pathfinding. And so pathfinding can be of any kind of thing that you want, but it needs to be something that plans a full route from the location of the, uh, of the enemy to the location of the player. That can come in a lot of different ways. The most common one that you see is something called A-star, which is a heuristic-based approach that allows for path planning that leverages Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. For those of you that took 201 um, here, you should have seen this. Um, Dijkstra does a great job, very, very fast, of, of basically an expressive uh, breadth-first search that allows for shortest path. And what A star does is it does an extra check to make it even faster. And what it does is it takes a heuristic. In this case, we would use Manhattan distance because we're dealing with a grid. And it would plot the best path based off of that heuristic. There's a lot of times, especially with grids like this, there are several choices, up, down, left, right, um, that you can go that all have basically the same relative cost. The heuristic tells you which one to go on. Do I go up? Do I go down? Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I try those branches first? What we have here is really, really nice for that kind of approach because it's a clean 128 by 128 grid. And since you won't be probably doing pathfinding for entities that are off screen, you want something that can easily handle that 128 by 128. The other thing is that because it's relatively small, 128 by 128 isn't that big of a deal. 
the overhead of A star, which requires uh, uses of tables and stuff like that, um, may be a little bit too much. You may actually still want just to do Dijkstra's heuristic to find the shortest path and then figure out what the next step is by that shortest path. Either way, both of them perfectly reasonable to implement uh, in Pico 8. Dijkstra's will be a shorter number of tokens, but possibly at a performance hit. A star will be certainly more tokens. So it really depends on where you're looking as far as your, your Pico 8 game goes. Um, the other thing is, you may have things where you want a decision tree based AI. Meaning that the AI will actually make choices depending on its situation. So maybe I have my two enemies here, a purple enemy and a green enemy, and the, the, the green enemy happens to be a healer. Well, under normal circumstances, it's going to try to attack my player. But maybe if under certain circumstances, I want it to heal another enemy. Those are decision tree based things. Again, depending on your game, you may want that kind of AI in there. It's not a huge deal. It's a lot of if statements, um, but it's not a big deal as far as sort of figuring out how to change your update function to handle that. All right, so that is the end of sort of the AI tutorial. At the end uh, of both uh, both of these, I will actually post uh, the, the, the two uh, pieces of code so that you can actually look at the AI stuff and then also look at the procedural generation stuff. Uh, if there are any questions, again, I, I am still going to be available uh, and live on Slack during the normal class periods from here until I get back. And so by all means, ask your questions in Slack. Um, and I will see you uh, very soon.